I'm an engineer, so I don't, I don't do slides. <laughs> I won't make you all suffer through uh, my slide deck creations. Um, but I saw that when I turned around, and literally I just I walked back five feet and I took a picture of it. And, and the way the organic light off that building matches with the architecture and structure of what, what's been built here, it was just, it, I was stunned. And uh, I wanted to share that picture because it was uh, amazing when I was looking at it. Um, and so, but I also need to apologize because I was walking through every one of these halls. There's flying cars. There's robots everywhere. Like everyone has something cool they're doing. And this is the most boring talk that you would have come for. So thank you for coming because this is about infrastructure, the thing that no one actually wants to deal with, right? This is DevSlam. We're developers. We like to develop things. We like to write code. And infrastructure is everything below your code. Everything that you're like, I don't want to deal with that. Just let me write my app, and it should just go out there magically. And, and this is an infrastructure talk, because I came from an inf infrastructure background. And there's new ways that I've learned to do infrastructure that I think are really fun. And some of them have to do with Kubernetes. But th the talk is really just about progression of what it was like and what it's been like to manage infrastructure in the state of, of data centers and, and old, applica old applications where we used to come from and now the cloud. And when I was a sysadmin, I had to buy a server, the very first server that I bought. I don't know if anyone remembers the first server you bought, it's kind of a special occasion for sysadmins where I had a workload and I had to go price out the server I needed to buy. I had to go find on HP's website, I had to find the model, I had to find the specs, and this was an investment. I had to, this was going to be four years that I was running this application on this server. And I sent an email, get it back, like, sorry, Justin, that's too much money. Do you actually need that? Yes, really, I do. Here's the reason. I'm going to run this application. And so finally, this giant box comes. And I unbox it, and I put in RAM, and I go to the data center, and I put it in, and I power it on, and I spend the next two weeks updating firmware. <laughs> and why a manufacturer can't sell me a box that has updated firmware, I'll never understand. But that's kind of the life cycle of, I need to buy a server because I want to run an application. And this is how infrastructure works. And eventually, I get the server all up to date, I put in a CD, it was back in the day, we had CDs. I know some people have floppies, I had CDs. You install your operating system, and then I SSH in, and I start copying files. And I say, I need this file from my dev environment, I need that one, I need this thing. And a little while later, I have an Apache server running. I have a web server, and Saeem's demo uh, was way faster than what I was doing. This was like a month process. And I'm like, how do I make this less complex? Because someone said, I, now you need a second server. And we need you to do the same thing on another box. I'm like, I'm not doing this again. This is too much work. So I learned this cool thing where like, oh, you can zip up some files and just SCP the whole thing over and extract it. I'm like, oh, that's what packages are. That's literally why package managers were created. <laughs> and, and I was a new sysadmin, but that's a dev file. Those are RPMs. So I go over, I package up my RPM, and I yum install it on the next box. And I was like, that was way easier. And I, I reduced a lot of the complexity of all those files, all those things that I had to change into a yum install. And I liked that. I thought it was great. It was a great way to abstract away some of those files and things that I was doing onto another server. And then I could, again, put a load balancer in front of it, and I had a, a web server to use. And that was all well and fine. But hardware and data centers did me a disservice in a couple ways, where I was stuck in that model. I thought that was the best thing you could do. You could get servers, and you can get bigger servers, and it would run more stuff. And, and so I was kind of stuck there until AWS came out. And I was like, well, what is this thing? Like, what's this cloud thing? When I add up the numbers, it didn't make sense. Right? Like, the AWS EC2 instance was more expensive than the box over four years. But then I actually went and did it. And the very first time that I created an EC2 instance, I did what most people do. I went to the console. And I'm hoping that my internet's working. Let's see. Oh. Get back into my account. Session expired. That didn't happen to me the first time. I forgot to log in this morning. Hold on a second. All right, now I'm getting back to my AWS account. And so 
when I first went into an EC2 console, I was like, okay, I just need to create a server. Let me figure out how to make the thing that I have right now in my data center, I need to make that in this cloud thing, because that's what everyone's doing. I just want to try it out. And of course, my region changed again. I did try to use the UAE region, and it did not work for me. So uh, I'm just, it, it's available. I know a lot of people are interested in it. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to Frankfurt because it's, it's closer, uh, or it's close enough for what I need to do. So I come in here to the console, and I'm just like, OK, well, I'm going to click the big orange button. I'm going to create an instance. And I didn't really know what I'm doing. It's, this is just, I'm, I'm new to this. And let's, let's call it Web 1. And sure, these defaults seem about right. Uh, I, I probably don't want to keep air. I'm sure many of you have, have done this yourself, the very first time you create an instance. And uh, I think the rest of the defaults are fine. So let's launch. And by the way, this background's tripping me out. None of these boxes are real. <laughs> it's all, it's like, to me, it's like, it's like VMs, right? Like, they're just like out there, it's software. Like, all these boxes up here, I was like, these are real. These are the servers that I get in my data center. But all this fake stuff, the facade around here, I was like, whoa, this is trippy with the video. I love it, though. Um, but there's my EC2 instance. And when I'm learning it, when I first started building this in the cloud, I'm like, OK, this still doesn't make sense because I have a box, I have a data center, I have all that investment in this thing that I built. So why do I need this cloud thing? Why do I need that? Because, you know, yeah, it was faster. I didn't have to worry about firmware. That was kind of cool. Um, but the thing that actually clicked for me was when I realized, I was like, oh, you know what? I did it wrong. I actually did the T2 micro. I didn't know what any of these instances mean. So what I want to do is I want to throw it away and get the one that I actually want. I need to get a different instance. And that was like, it kind of clicked for me. I was like, oh, I can try things. My learning experience here is a lot faster. And I started realizing that the hardest thing to do with a lot of technology people and developers, infrastructure people, is teaching them, is helping them learn things on their own. And giving them a good environment that they can go learn stuff is great. There's a bug up here. I'm sorry. Uh, but let's go ahead and call this one Web 2. And I'm going to go to my a, a bigger, you know, let's just, let's, let's pick a medium because that was the right, the right thing I needed. Oh, no. And in that first instance, cost me less than a penny to deploy because I deleted it. I didn't need it anymore. And I learned something new by deploying this new instance. And what I did as a sysadmin was I literally had a piece of paper at my desk. And I wrote down every checkbox that I checked to create the instance. And that was my documentation. And I said, hey, I'll never remember this again. I did it right one time, so I crossed out the T2 micro. And I'm like, actually, I want the medium. And so now I have a piece of paper at my desk. And anytime anyone came up to me like, I need another EC2 instance, I knew how to do it. I go follow my checklist. I was like, this one, this one, this one, okay, that, not that one. And when one of the other sysadmins on my team said, hey, we need to create an EC2 instance, I handed them the piece of paper. <laughs> I said, here you go, here's the docs. <laughs> We're ready to go. You can go run this on your own. You don't, need to, you don't need me. Make a copy if you want. And that was documentation. That was our automation, was this piece of paper. And doing it in the console is great for learning. And there are some things that I still think are totally fine and appropriate to do in the console. A lot of people will tell you, you have to do infrastructure as code as everything. You should be scripting everything. Nothing should ever be. No. Like, I don't think that in practice, that's not how it goes. There are things in your environment that never change. If I treated this instance like a server and it sat there for four years and no one else SSH'd into it, I would have wasted time by automating it. That would have been time I could have done something else. And if you're treating your cloud infrastructure like you did your data center, then you don't actually need to automate it. You should make some checks and, and verify that things are running the way you want. But automating some of those things that never change is OK. And don't let anyone tell you that you should never go to the console. That is just not the real world. <laughs> those people live in a dream, and they want to stay in that dream and, and probably sell you something. <laughs> 
Um, but in my case, this was great, and I'm still learning here, and this was how it was progressing. I said, okay, now I have people coming up to me all the time, and they're saying, we need more of those things that you have. And so now I'm really looking at how do I automate it. Now I really do want something that can verify this, and that's where infrastructure as code comes in. So what does every sysadmin, what does every developer do the very first time they're like, I need infrastructure as code? They're like, Terraform EC2 instance. Okay, that looks about right. AWS instance, sure. I'm going to go ahead and just copy and paste this because this is what everyone does. They take the first example in the docs and we'll copy that over. Where are we? Okay. Oh, I'm already in it. So I have it here. I have my copy and paste. We're ready to go. Uh, one thing I probably want to do is, no, let's just leave it. Yeah, we're good. So OK, I already have plugins. Cool. So this is, your, this is your cycle for Terraform, right? I need to plan it. I need to init. I'm going to go create something. That, that's probably right. Right? I don't need to save output files. I don't need to do any of that. I'm just learning still. And so I can do my Terraform apply. And sure enough, it's going to do exactly what the code says. It's going to give me an instance in AWS. So I was like, cool. Infrastructure as code is great. This is, this is how everyone should do it now, right? Like, I learned the new way. So all you people doing it in the console need to stop. Because I learned something new, and you're all wrong. That's not how the real world works. Because infrastructure as code is, is awesome. And of course, my instance is already there. I'm sure it's already there. Let's, there we go. I got my Hello World instance. But uh, you know, I did it wrong. Again, I'm still learning. I'm still trying to figure out how to do these things. I don't want it called Hello World. This is supposed to be you know, Web Terraform. right? So I go in and I change it in the console, because that's what I know. That's the thing that I understood was the console's the way to make some of these changes. Everyone knows what's going to happen now, right? Terraform's going to come in. Infrastructure is, as code, someone else is going to change the code inside my repo, and it's going to change something in production that was unintended, that they didn't check it in, right? Like, there's this flow of, like, everyone's like, oh, you got to do it always in Terraform first. But people have to have, they have to learn. They have to understand what it's like. And they have to know where these changes even exist. And so right here, you can see, you know, we're, we're going to change that name back. And I don't care what you say, every time you commit code to that repo, CICD is going to go ahead and push it out there. And it's going to change it, whether you want it to or not. If you're lucky, the infrastructure's code changes as fast as your code. If anyone's ever done a VPC with Terraform, you probably did that once. And two years later, <laughs> you had to change it again. But someone went to the console, and you're in a state now of Terraform state file that you can't recover that. There's no way for Terraform to now go do the thing you ex expected it to do. And you're in there modifying manually a Terraform state file in JSON. And if you've ever had an outage, and you manually had to recover a Terraform state, I'm sorry, a lot of us have been there. But it's a learning experience. And you, in infrastructure as code, your infrastructure moves as fast as your code. Only when code changes, the changes go out. The other thing I learned sometime later was I was playing with Kubernetes. I was like, what's this Kubernetes thing? How does this work? Deployed an example application to it. And I was like, wow, this is, this is kind of fascinating. Like, it, just, it, it can deploy that thing, but I bet it's not as good as my infrastructure as code. I bet there are things that it can't do that my awesome Terraform can do. Because at this point, once you get complicated Terraform, you can make modules. Just like I took an RPM, I took files, and I compressed them up to a thing, and I deploy that as my new method of deployments. I can take my complex Terraform, I package it up as a module, and I can do that over and over and over again to more and more infrastructure. And Kubernetes has those manifest files, so I did a great demo of like simplifying some of that stuff. But I just example Hello Worlds. The thing that got me was when I went up to the the system, and I was like, what if happens if I delete one of them? Right? Like, everyone talks about this Kubernetes thing, but it can't be that great. 
It still has problems, even if it's highly available, all this stuff. Like, I'm going to go ahead and delete that thing. And in my infrastructure as code worlds, I'd have to go make some code changes to get that back. I'd have to figure out how to get back to the state, the known state that I wanted to. In Kubernetes, the thing it taught me was, I mean, that's back before I could list the command. These control loops that run inside of Kubernetes are constantly watching the state of my code, the thing that I want to exist, and the thing that exists. Big difference between a Terraform world and an infrastructure as software world is what I like to call it. These control loops constantly merge that state over and over again. And as infrastructure moves from, I need to touch it once every four years, I need to touch it occasionally, and I need it to constantly be available in the state that I declared. You have to move from, I can manually click some things in a console, I can define some things as code and run them occasionally, and I need something that watches and applies the state all the time. And that's what Kubernetes does. And that's infrastructure as software. That's the other piece of it where we've moved beyond just the code. Now we have the control loops. But what does that for infrastructure? I could run Terraform in a for loop. <laughs> I, can, I can bash my way through this. This is possible. Like Terraform can do that for me, right? It's like, yeah, like maybe, maybe don't do that right away. The control loops are great. And I, I kept learning from this pattern what Kubernetes was doing. I said, OK, well, let's see what does that. And there's this project called Crossplane. There's a talk about it later today. Uh, I'm, I'm excited for that one. Uh, but there's some other tools that do similar things. But I'm going to show you Crossplane because I like some of the ways it works. And I need to find my Crossplane file real fast. Uh, So we have what looks like a Kubernetes object. It's a lot of the same definitions, but if you're familiar with Kubernetes, there's these custom resource definitions. You can take anything you want and define it in YAML, because everyone loved YAML for about a month. And, and they all hate it now, but that's OK, because you can still generate the YAML. You can still generate the data with other tools, but you get these CRDs with Crossplane. And this defines how I want my instance. This defines basically Terraform and YAML formats in a lot of ways. Right? Like this is the same data I need. It's, just, it's gonna make a lot of the same API calls. But the difference is Crossplane has a controller that's gonna do it continually. So if I deploy this to my Kubernetes cluster, I'm going to get an instance inside the cluster. I already had a CRD that existed. I had Crossplane deployed. So I can get my instances. I have, I have an instance in, that's defined in Kubernetes, and Crossplane takes that data and then shoves it in AWS and says, hey, I need this to be running. And I, I realized that I actually I, I for, forgot to delete the one last night that I was running, but this is what it's doing. I can go in. And I can modify this instance like I modified the Kubernetes pod, and Crossplane will put it back. And it'll do it right away, because it, it knows that it's looking at this control loop. It's doing it continuously. And you don't have to worry. For things that need to be up to date and available, this is the method we should be using for our infrastructure, as well as our applications. You can manage your, application, your infrastructure like you manage your applications in this continual loop. The other thing I really like about Crossplane is it lets you do packages. Just like an RPM, just like a Terraform module, I can take something really, really complex and condense it into something that only needs a little bit of data. Let's copy it to the current folder. So this is an EKS cluster. I have a package that is available on a repository that I was able to install that condensed everything I need for an EKS cluster in Amazon. This is VPCs, security groups, IAM, everything that would be default in my accounts that I can set up as defaults for this package. And as a, as a user, I just like, I just give me a Kubernetes cluster. Like, I don't care. Just give it to me now. 
I didn't have to define very much. This is the entire spec of what I could define. And just like the EC2 instance, I can get an entire Kubernetes cluster. I can get the entire thing. All that stuff gets defined in that package. We can take all that complexity and, and condense it into those smaller formats that are usable uh, by people that don't need to know all the details. And um, I think they're called prod right. Nope, it's a. Uh, yeah, prod ready cluster. Oh, come on. I'm going to debug that in a little bit. But you can get the same workflow for instances, and you condense that into, into these other things, which is great, just like my server with RPM files. And, and the other thing that I really liked about using Kubernetes for this, because again, you can do it with Terraform in a for loop. You can do it a lot of different ways. But Kubernetes is ubiquitous. You, I can run it on my laptop. I can run it in the cloud. And all of these demos are running on this box right here. This was my Kubernetes cluster that I built when we were working on EKS Anywhere. EKS Anywhere is the EKS distribution you can run in your data center. And it runs on bare metal. There's four nodes in that box. And I know a lot of people are really excited, again, about the UAE region that's here. A lot of people, are, we, want, we want EKS. We want, I, I, we're working on it. But if you have a data center, you actually can get EKS in your data center now. Like this is, a fr this is open source. Like you can go get it. If you want support, you can pay AWS, just like you would for an EKS cluster. And, and this sort of model allowed me even more so to realize, um, I, have a, I have a ton of stuff running this. Oh, it's not even going to show half of it because it's all there. Um, but you can, again, you, it's just, it runs anywhere. And uh, let's actually open it up for you. This box has, I think we, we calculated last night, it was like 128 gigs of RAM, 4 terabytes of storage, and 32 cores, i7 cores. Um, and it was, just, it was a fun thing to build. I know a lot of people run Raspberry Pi clusters. Those are awesome. Lots of people do local development on their laptops. And, and I wanted to run EKS Anywhere on something that could run a lot of workloads, including this provisioning my infrastructure in AWS. And as we move more and more towards how do we get control loops? How do we make things more available? How do we get things faster to deploy? We have to move to this model that Kubernetes really made standard for a lot of people. And using the control loops and using what's already there and just taking the existing stuff and extending it a little bit is, I think, the future of how we're going to manage a lot of this infrastructure. You can still do Terraform. It's still, there's still a place for all this stuff. All, it's the spectrum of how much availability and automation you need. And the more available you need it, the more I'd encourage you to check out things that run as infrastructure software in control loops. And, and again, Crossplane's great. Uh, AWS controllers for Kubernetes. There's a lot of projects out there that will do this for you. So um, I just highly encourage you. Um, I have a bunch of AWS socks and shirts. If anyone wants to come, get, this is my end of my talk. But I, I'm, just, I'm just selling you right now. Like, if you want a, a shirt or socks, I have them for you. Um, but thank you for having me, and thanks for coming. So. Thank you, Justin. How do you go through airports with this thing? Uh, this was the first time I flew with it, and, and I checked it. And so I checked the bag. Okay. <laughs> it had to go to a special uh, oversize. Yeah. So uh, I feel this is a good topic for like a whole two-hour workshop, right, <laughs> with people with their laptops. So when people leave the stage and you know, they're, they're heading back, what would be the one or two things you want them to remember you know, from this talk, things that maybe they want to try out or whatever? Um, two important things or one important thing from this talk? I think the interface for Kubernetes is here to stay, whether Kubernetes itself is. Whether, whether Kubernetes is the thing that exists for a long time, the way you extend it and the way that it makes it easy to get uh, APIs and write controllers and have a storage state, I think is really important. So if you don't know Kubernetes today, I would encourage you to explore it on your own. Run it on your laptop. EKS Anywhere will also run on your laptop. Um, but Minikube, Kind, the first time that I explored Kubernetes was I wrote a scheduler in Bash. 
because I knew Bash scripting really well. And I was like, I could write a scheduler. If I could schedule a pod with Bash, I will understand the system better and understand the control loops and how it works and figure out how, how you explore things and how you learn things. But I think the interface is, is here to stay for a lot of reasons. And, and the power of Kubernetes isn't necessarily in the core, core of the controllers, but the API and extensibility of Kubernetes. OK, thank you. Yeah. Well, yep. thank, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. There's, there's, oh, there's the question. Yeah. Uh, well, very cool for uh, the ETS anywhere. Would you recommend to install it on bare metal or virtual machine? Uh, it supports right now. It supports VMware and bare metal. Whatever you have ex experience in, whatever you have expertise in. If you have a VMware infrastructure, go for it. Like, there's a lot of benefits in, in having virtual machines because you can carve it up. You can auto scale some of that. You can get storage that's a little abstracted. Bare metal is hard. The first time that I built a production Kubernetes cluster was on bare metal, and it took me three months. <laughs> it, was a, it was a long process to do. EKS Anywhere, I can deploy on that box in 10 minutes, but I'm pretty familiar with it now. But if you don't have experience, if you don't have expertise on bare metal, or like figure out which one your company or how you want to run it, because that's the, you have to support it going forward. You have to have expertise in-house to be able to do those things. So there, we have a lot more providers coming. Um, we have snowballs that, that work. I've done demos on, on the big snowballs that will ship you. Hey, AWS will ship you um, if you have like a rugged edge environment. Uh, but we have a bunch of other providers that are coming. Uh, but it is open source right now. So you try it on your laptop today. And, and if you have hardware, if you have some old desktops, it works. Thank you. And what about the hybrid environment? Sorry. What's that? A hybrid environment. Hybrid as in do you want a job to go between cloud and on-prem? Yes. Or do you want just uh, management inside both? EKS management inside both EKS uh, in cloud and on-prem, is it possible? Yeah, uh, I, we don't recommend splitting a single workload that goes both places. Um, but if you have clusters and you want clusters in both places, you can absolutely do that. And we'll support both having clusters. And you can migrate workloads back and forth. But worker nodes that span across a WAN isn't usually a good idea. Uh, so that's, that's something that we absolutely support. We know people that want clusters in both. We also have a tool called EKS Connector that lets you see your on-prem. I can, I can view this cluster in my EKS console. And so I can see my clusters from everywhere. And that works not just EKS anywhere. That works, I have a GKE cluster that I can connect back to AWS. I have a, you know, AKS. Like, I can connect any Kubernetes cluster. I can connect my kind cluster on my laptop and see it in the AWS console as a central place to say, like, where are all my clusters? Well, who has access to them? What's running in them? And, and that EKS connector is another way to get sort of that single place to kind of verify what's going on. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, th th thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious, is there any blog or somewhere where we, ha where we can look up the bots and the hardware of that box? <laughs> uh, if you search for Kubernetes uh, with a C, Kubernetes with a C is, is Kubernetes, is what I've, du I've dubbed this box, um, you'll find my blog on all the build material. Now you can go build it yourself if you want. Awesome. Um, so everything's out there. It's, I have links to all the hardware. It took me uh, about two months to do. Um, it was like three weeks of actual build time and a bunch of time just planning, finding the resources. So I, I did some of the homework up front. Um, but yeah, if you want to build something like it, I would love to see it. I would love to see you build one. I actually wanted to do one in a GameCube because it's another cube. Like, why not? Like, let's take all the consumer stuff that uh, had cube in the name and, and make them Kubernetes clusters. And if you don't mind, how much would it cost? Like uh, this, one, this one costs right about $6,000. Um, with, the, with all the storage and compute in it, the, the servers themselves uh, cost like five and a half thousand. <laughs> so the rest of the lights and the cases and stuff like that were, were pretty small compared to just getting four servers this size uh, in that box. <laughs> yep. Uh, so uh, there is a movement that is happening in software, right? So you, you can run software on commodity hardware like Minio or Cassandra or whatever you could think of. So Kubernetes, from my point of view, is something which brings in commodity hardware back. So what is your take on it? Like big data center, uh, enterprise grade machines, can we just have commodity hardware running, on, running with Kubernetes clusters? Yeah. yeah, and that depends on your tolerance for the availability. Like if you've run MinIO in a, in a larger scale environment, um, you might need to shift over to S3, or you might need something else that has a little more high availability. I've, I've been in those environments. But the first time that I ran my Kubernetes cluster on-prem, I took old vSphere hardware. 
Because the vSphere, you had to match CPUs. You had to match what, uh, you know, possibility. All the, all the CPUs have their own set of functions. And if your vSphere cluster didn't match the CPUs, you had to throw it out of the cluster. And I was like, well, give it to me. So I told my, I told my exactly. system, I was, like, I, I was like, hey, can I have those boxes? I didn't care. I actually didn't, I didn't need to run a hypervisor. And that's where it really mattered. I was like, I just need workloads to have compute. And if I could do that, but you can totally mix and match your CPUs and commodity hardware. I had a cluster one time that had a couple desktops as nodes. Because like, well, these desktops are powerful. They're not highly available, but the workloads can tolerate some of that downtime. Or I can run more of them uh, to be able to spread it. And so yeah, if you have those resources, it all really depends on your workloads. Because Kubernetes is designed to, you know, to recover from crashes right? yeah. and failures. So this to moment. A point. <laughs> huh? Sorry? To, a, to a certain point, yes. It, as long as it's set up, so EKS Anywhere, we run it the way we run EKS in the cloud, which is not the way a lot of people do it. When we run EKS Anywhere, our recommendation is you have three etcd servers, and you have a separate two uh, API server and, and scheduler and controller manager. A lot of people put those together. And they say, you only need three boxes for all the control planes. Like, no, no, we do five. EKS, we want five, because we want etcd to be isolated. Would you run your... Postgres database on your API server database? No, you would never do that. Like that's, you want the database to be separate from the API server, and that's how we recommend you run it. And so it does depend on your tolerances, though. Because if your application is like, well, you know, I don't use the database that much, or it doesn't matter if like, my API goes down for a little while, that's up to you. Uh, but if you need highly available, yeah, you're going to spend a little extra money to get similar boxes that have HA built in, dual power supplies, all that stuff. But it, for for commodity stuff, like for jobs and workloads and web stuff that you can scale, absolutely. I love doing commodity hardware. So we can expect more or less like Raspberry Pi data centers in future, for instance. I, I mean, yeah, like I, I would love to see ARM more in the data center. Uh, we have Graviton 3 in, in regions, and it's great. Raspberry Pis aren't quite there, um, but ARM is, is taking over for a lot of stuff that we're doing because M1 and all those things that's coming yeah. up. Yeah. yeah, and as containers are an abstraction above that, like you can compile your container both places. It's one container image. My RPMs back in the day, I had to compile them twice, and I had to store them twice, and I had to make sure it works. Registries, container registries, I just say, give me Nginx. And it knows, oh, do you want the ARM one or the x86 or the RISC or whatever, and I can pull down the right image for my CPU. So some of that stuff gets abstracted away by the way containers didn't work. Looking forward. Yeah. All right, awesome. Thank you very much, Justin. Yeah, thank you. Hey, cheers. <laughs>